Well, it's a treat to be invited out of state and to get to speak to you all, and especially to lead off your very first special education law conference. Um, I think I'm probably the right guy to do this. I graduated from law school the same year that IDEA was passed. We didn't call it IDEA back then. We called it Public Law 94142. How many of you all remember that terminology? You are the dinosaurs, folks. <laughs> Why are you still here? <clears throat> So that was 1975, that's the year I graduated from the University of Texas Law School. Can I hear of a hook 'em horns? Anybody? No, not so much, okay. But I grew up in the Midwest, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, not too far from here, and I, my goal in life was not to be a lawyer, and certainly not to be a special education lawyer, I didn't know anything about that. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think I was unusual when I grew up, I think mainly what I wanted is to grow up and do something that would cause everybody to like me <laughs> and respect me and admire me. That's what I wanted and I don't really think that's terribly unusual. And the culture I grew up in, I grew up in a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago where everybody went to the Catholic schools and that's what, that's what we did. My mom taught at St. Sabina's Catholic School on the south side of Chicago and that's where I went to school and that's where we all went to school. So, uh, so my teacher, Sister Mary Holywater, uh, had never endorsed the United States Constitution. Uh, therefore, we had no free speech rights, we had no due process, but we got a good education. But this is the culture I grew up in, so I tried to figure out, well now, who is the most liked, admired, and respected person in this culture? So I wanted to be a priest. So uh, high school, I went off to a Catholic seminary and I was gonna be a priest, and I got a good education there. I don't regret that at all, but I got to be 16, 17, 18. I started looking at the fine print on the contract a little more carefully. <laughs> you know, they got a lot of rules about your personal life, and I thought, you know, I really want to be liked, admired, and respected, but can I do that in a profession where they let you have sex? That's what I was wondering, and so <clears throat> that's when I decided to become a lawyer. <laughs> well, I thought everybody liked lawyers, you know. I've since found out this is not the case. Uh, they did a survey recently that showed only 17% of Americans hold lawyers in high regard. And that's disturbing because 17% of Americans are lawyers these days. <laughs> and you know, there's a whole genre of jokes about lawyers. In fact, I'll offer you anybody here a nickel if you tell me a lawyer joke I haven't heard. I know what's black and brown and looks good on a lawyer, that's an angry Doberman. <laughs> when you have a thousand lawyers chained together at the bottom of the lake, you got a pretty good start. What's the difference between a lawyer and a catfish? One is a scum-sucking bottom dweller, the other is a fish. <laughs> what do lawyers and sperm have in common? One out of a million has a chance to become a human being. <laughs> and then a superintendent told me this one. He said, you know the difference, you know what you call a group of lawyers in a group skydive? I said, no, what do you call that? He said, skeet. So, uh, so I decided to become a school lawyer. I thought, well, you know, if you're gonna be a lawyer, you wanna work with people who are nice. That's what I thought. <laughs> nice people that work for public schools. Then I got to know you under the cloak of attorney-client privilege. And I found out it's not always that nice. You know, I got this call from a superintendent. He says, do the band boosters have to register as a terrorist organization? <laughs> And uh, in Texas, I don't know what it's like in Indiana, but in West Texas, you get west of Fort Worth, they hire their principals on the Clint Eastwood model. <laughs> they want Dirty Harry. It's not a gender thing. They're happy with Dirty Harriet, but they're looking for tough. And uh, got this call from this guy out in West Texas. He says, well, let's just get to the bottom line, lawyer. How much time will I have to serve if I beat the snot out of him? <laughs> he was talking about the director of special education. So, <laughs> so yeah, we had, a, we had a situation our firm got involved in where the head football coach had beat up the superintendent. Apparently they had a conversation at the end of the season that didn't go well. <clears throat> and uh, the coach beat him up. And the superintendent was in the hospital a couple of days. He made a full recovery. But our firm gets a call from the board president and they say, they told us what happened. We said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, what do you think we want to do? We want to fire the superintendent. I mean, I'm sorry, we said, we want to fire the coach. We want to fire the coach. Well, by this time, we'd been doing school law for a while, and we'd been in Texas for a while, so we knew to probe a little bit more. We said, tell us about the coach. What's his record? 
They said, well, this year we were three and seven. We haven't been to the playoffs in five years. We said, fire his ass. My God, what's wrong with you people? So they proceeded to do that, and uh, the whole town showed up. It was a public meeting, and it was kind of like a wedding. You know, you came in, and the superintendent or coach, and, you know, you'd sit on one side or the other based on that. And they fired him. And we provided good legal advice, so he stayed fired, but he ran for the school board a couple of years after that, and he got elected, so there you go. So this is one reason why I love uh, school law. So, so I drifted off into special education. I thought I'd work with you folks, because again, I thought you were nice, <laughs> and mostly you are, but, uh, but there's, there's some stress in uh, working in the world of special education. Um, so uh, we are gonna talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about, we have until 10 o'clock, and we're going to talk about, we're going to kind of review all of the laws that, we're going to look at the court cases that happened in the last couple of years. And I always try to put the emphasis on the practical. Uh, in our firm, all we do is represent school districts. And mostly what I do at this stage of my career is this type of thing. I do a lot of training, I do a lot of writing, and, uh, and it's, it's focused on uh, not just special education law, but law in general. So, uh, so we're going we're gonna to take a look at the, the, the year in review, uh, hit the highlights of the various court cases. We're not going to talk about new laws because, you know, the law hasn't changed in a long time. The last time Congress addressed special education law is uh, 2004. Uh, that's, what, 15 years ago now? Uh, the regulations that we're operating under were adopted in 2006. So we haven't had changes on that. Uh, we have had a lot of litigation, and, uh, and what I try to emphasize about the litigation is the lessons to be learned. You know, lawyers talk about cases the same way preachers talk about parables in the Bible. The parables in the Bible tell a story and carry a lesson, and it's the same thing with these court cases. They tell a story and they carry a lesson, and so that's what I'm going to try to emphasize in the time I have with you all. Uh, uh, this morning, and then I've got a couple of breakout sessions that I'm going to that I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of the day that focus a lot on discipline and behavior and that type of thing. So let's get started. Any 504 coordinators out there? Raise your hands high. Be proud. Good for you. Competition for jobs like that is fierce these days. So, <laughs> so. Uh, I was in a school district in Texas several years ago where I was talking about Section 504 and uh, they had a handbook. They had a nice handbook and it had all sorts of information including the name of the 504 coordinator. So I got to that part and I'm kind of looking at the handbook as I go and I, I see the guy's name in the handbook. I said, well now your 504 coordinator is, uh, looked down and said, George Rodriguez. So if you have any you know, stuff comes up, uh, Mr. Rodriguez is the go-to guy. Well, as soon as I said that, I could tell I had I'd said something amusing because people are nudging their neighbor and they're smiling and I see all this going on. I said, what's the deal? <clears throat> Somebody says, well, uh, George died about three years ago. <laughs> I said, really? I said, well, he's listed here as your 504 coordinator. They said, well, yeah, well, we know, but he's dead. I said, okay. <laughs> this is why I ask you to raise your hand, you know? superintendent came by after that presentation. She said, how did it go? I said, it went real well. I said, but you know, I think I learned something I think you ought to know. <clears throat> she said, what's that? I said, did you know you got a dead man for a 504 coordinator? She said, yes, that's part of our strategic plan. <laughs> I said, really? She said, yeah, that way when the parents get angry and they call, we say, I'm sorry, he can't come to the phone. I said, well, that's not going to last very long. She said, I won't be in this district much longer. So this is, this is superintendent think, you see, strategic thinking. So we're leading off with ADA 504 partly because I put my materials in alphabetical order. ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Section 504 is part of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. They really say the same thing. They're very simple laws. They're very short laws. It's, an, it's amazing the amount of litigation we have over a very short statute. What they say in a nutshell is you can't discriminate against people with disabilities. Okay. Uh, the only difference, the significant difference between the two laws is, is to whom do they apply. 504 applies to you if you receive federal financial assistance, which pretty much covers school districts. ADA covers you if you're in business of some sort or you operate a private school, so ADA is not dependent on the receipt of federal funds. 
Public schools are subject to both of them, but they're pretty much the same, so the courts interpret them uh, pretty much the same. There is a lot of litigation. If you look at your written materials, you'll see there's a lot of litigation over Section 504. Uh, it is not unusual these days when a lawsuit is filed against a school district that the plaintiff will allege that the school district violated IDEA, that's our primary special education law, and 504, and ADA, and the U.S. Constitution, and the Magna Carta, and the Mayflower Compact, and whatever. So ADA, 504, fairly often thrown in there. And uh, lots of cases here. Uh, so, <clears throat> one of the cases uh, is uh, from Illinois and it has to do with the degree to which you have to modify your program to uh, ensure that students with disabilities have an equal opportunity to participate. And as I say in the handout material, it's not a real clear line. You have to make reasonable accommodation without fundamentally altering your program. Well, we can argue all day about what is a fundamental alteration and what is a reasonable accommodation. This particular case from Illinois had to do with para-athletes and whether or not they were entitled to have a separate category at the state track championship. And the court said no. We think that would be a fundamental alteration of your program. But uh, the, the main case in here that I want to uh, emphasize is this Elk Grove case. It's from California. And this has to do with apparently a hot-headed basketball player. I don't know if you folks in Indiana have any experience <laughs> with hot-headed basketball coaches, for example, but, uh, but this, this, is, this is a case, and you know, I made a prediction here. The school has not won this case, but I think they will. Now here's what happened. Uh, the kid apparently had a lot of emotional outbursts and the coach dismissed him from the team. And the parents sued the school district alleging that this was a form of disability discrimination. Now here's an important point about 504. IDEA as a general rule does not apply to your extracurricular activities. IDEA is about instruction and academics and that type of thing. It's about behavior and all, but it all comes back to learning. Uh, it's not about the basketball team. 504 applies to everything that the school district does. So it's real important that coaches and sponsors and daycare operators and everybody that's connected with the school understands that we cannot be discriminating against people with disabilities. So this is a case, that, now this is, this is a case that's early on in the litigation and the school district lawyers are trying to get the case dismissed right off the bat and that's what lawyers do try to minimize my client's exposure and minimize the cost of this litigation and get rid of the case as soon as possible. So they pretty well concede a point. They say, you know, we did dismiss him from the basketball team because of his disability. That's why we did it. And the court said, well, we're not going to toss the case out then. We think this case needs to go a little bit further. So my prediction here is the school will win this case because I think they can line up coaches from here to work California that will testify that it's an essential component of participation in an extracurricular activity that you be able to control your emotions so that you're not getting into fights and you're not getting technical fouls and you're not getting removed from the game. So I want to tell you a story that I think illustrates this pretty well. You know, and it's interesting, this is a basketball case from California, and I'm in Indiana, a hotbed of basketball. Texas, as you know, it's more about football. I had a fascinating conference call several years ago with uh, the head football coach and the special education director. Now, this was an odd combination. Now, as a lawyer, we get quite a few calls where there's a group of people in the room, you know, and, and I always get nervous about that. Uh, because I cannot see your body language and I can't see you at all and I know that you're calling me because there's an internal dispute among you all and you're call we're the tiebreaker. You know? <laughs> you know, well let's see what the lawyer thinks. And so this, you know, so this call is between the special ed director and the head football coach and I'm pre I've been doing this a while, I'm pretty good at picking up pretty quickly what answer each party wants. You rarely call the lawyer without a desired answer. <laughs> you usually know what answer you're hoping you're going to get. This involved a, a uh, linebacker who uh, last season had been kicked off the football team. Now the student was identified as having a serious emotional disturbance. And it was pretty clear to me the coach did not want him on the team. And so I assumed that this is a slow, unathletic 
emotionally disturbed student. Because football coaches generally want emotionally disturbed students on their football team, <laughs> especially at linebacker. It helps. And so, but I could tell this coach doesn't want this kid on the team. He kicked him off last year. Now, the parents did not make an issue of that. It's time for practice to start again. And, and the question is, can the student come back on the team? So I, I asked the coach, I said, coach, have you ever, uh, have you kicked kids off the team in the past? Yes. Well, when you kick them off the team, how long do you normally kick them off the team? The rest of that season. Have you ever permanently barred a student from your athletic? No. I said, well, then let's not make this the first one. You know, that, that would not be good. Let's not, let's not do that. He said, well, okay, I figured you'd say that. But he's got to follow our rules. I said, absolutely, he's got to follow your rules. Uh, but, uh, but I said, but you have to reasonably accommodate him to help him follow your rules. He said, what are you talking about? This is, this is extracurricular. This is outside of the school. I said, I know. There's a law called Section 504. It requires that in all school activities we reasonably accommodate the student. He said, well, what would that look like? Well, so I started making it up at this point. I don't know. I said, why don't you have a, why don't you write out a one-to-one -one contract with this student that pertains to his participation on your football team? You don't do that with the other kids, do you? No. Do it for this kid. Why don't you have a one-to-one -one session with him before practice and talk about what we're going to do and how it's going to be and give him a little pep talk and a little guidance before you start your practice. And that's when he blew up at me. He said, you don't understand how this works. If you think we can have a one-to-one -one meeting with this kid before every practice, I said, no, coach, I'm not talking about that. Do it once before your two-a-days. Now, I wanted him to hear me say two-a-days because this established street cred for me with the coach. And so my point in telling you the story was, as a lawyer, my job is to anticipate what might go wrong and protect my client from bad consequences. This coach is going to kick this kid off the team again. I can see it coming. And this time, the parent might do what this parent did in California and say, I think that's disability discrimination. How do I defend the school district? I want to be able to go to court and say, Your Honor, we knew the student had an emotional disturbance. Here are some of the things that we did to accommodate the student, to give him a good opportunity to be a part of our football team. We did all those things, Your Honor. And despite all of that, here's the behavior we got, and it was unacceptable, and it's not in compliance with our code for our athletes. And so we removed him from the football team. If, 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 if I can convince the judge of that, then we have reasonably accommodated. But the point is, you reasonably accommodate first, and, and then you apply your rules to the student. So this Elk Grove case, pretty confident that, that the school will be, when the facts come out, they'll probably be able to establish that they did, uh, that, you know, that it's an essential requirement for participating in extracurriculars that you be able to control your emotions. So there you go. Uh, another illustration of this point of, uh, of it being uh, reasonable accommodations, this is an interesting one. This is a student who had a, prescription from a doctor for a, a, a therapist to be with him 40 hours a week. That's a lot. And they didn't ask the school to pay for it. They just asked the school to allow the therapist to come to school with the student all day long. And you know, I think the school had a knee-jerk reaction to, mm, not going to do that. But when they went to court, what did they testify? Somebody said, well, you know, it's really a minor matter. We can work it out. Well. If it's a minor matter that you can work out, then it's probably a reasonable accommodation. You know, If the school had substantial, genuine objections to the presence of this person in our building all day long, that would be a different thing. But they testified, oh, it's a minor matter. We could work it out. So you know, check your instant reaction to things. And don't say no just because we've never done it before. Special education law is full of things we've never done before. And we've never done it before is not a good defense. Uh, we are expected to be creative and, 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 and so on. So that, that's kind of an interesting one. So <clears throat> let's see, where are we? Well, let's see, I, I guess I've got to point this in the right direction. There we go. So now there's a, a horrendous case from Brownsville, Texas. I will tell you, our firm was not involved with this one. Uh, but, and, and this is an unpleasant one to talk about, but it's important. In the litigation over Section 504, one term that you'll see a lot is deliberate indifference. And let me give you a little background and, and context for this. This is a, this is a student who drowned in, in a school swimming pool. 
Uh, this was an, uh, uh, an adult student. I don't know if the student was, the student was above 18, I think. There's an adult student, severely disabled. And the student uh, regularly, part of the IEP involved being in the pool with all sorts of protections, all sorts of things designed to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Student was to wear a, a nose guard and people were to be with her. The temperature was to be at a certain, and all of this was written out. And uh, I don't know what happened, but on this particular occasion, um, something went wrong. Uh, the student got water in her lungs. She did not recover. She died. The family sues the school district. Now, you know, this is, this is what the lawyers would call a personal injury case. This is a tort. This is a personal injury case. We, our courts are full of these, and they're usually filed in state court. And in state court, like if you have an automobile accident, or the doctor operates on the left leg when she was supposed to operate on the right leg, then you've got a tort case and you go to state court and you prove negligence. How does this case end up in federal court? Well, Texas, and I'll bet Indiana is the same, provides immunity to our school districts from that type of lawsuit. So if they file this case in state court saying that this is a personal injury tort and the school district was negligent, the court's going to toss it out because our state laws say that the school districts are immune from that type of liability. So the lawyers take it into federal court and try to make it into a federal case, but in order to do that, they have to prove more than negligence, they have to prove that the school was deliberately indifferent. Well, you know, I represent school districts and I hope nobody can ever prove that we were deliberately indifferent. We make mistakes all the time. Um, we're sometimes careless when we shouldn't be. I think everybody will acknowledge that. We should never be deliberately indifferent to a student's interests. And so that's what they have to prove. But what I want to point out about this is when you hear, when I hear the term deliberate indifference, I think, well, they just didn't care about this child. And I am confident that's not the case. And that's not the way the courts interpret it. And that's why I'm spending a little time on this case. Uh, the, the, the term deliberate indifference does not mean, according to this court, it doesn't mean they didn't care about the student. It means that the school consciously failed to provide the accommodations that were required. Now why would they consciously fail to provide the accommodations that were written into this student's plan? I'd be willing to bet because they'd done that before. You know, have you ever had a safety plan that you didn't completely implement and you did it repeatedly? for weeks and months and nothing bad happened until one day something bad does happen. I think that's what we have in Brownsville here. And so uh, the, the court said if you knew there were written accommodations that you were required to provide and you didn't provide them, we call that deliberate indifference. And therefore the school district uh, in this case is facing the possibility of personal liability for that. <sighs> dog v. Dog allergies. Now in my written materials here, I think this is, uh, and this is the Doe case. Yeah, U Doe versus U.S. Uh, Secretary of Transportation. Just want to caution you about the Doe family. This is the most litigious family in America. <laughs> you want to look out for them. I know school has just started. You might want to take a look at the class roles and see if it's a student named John Doe <laughs> or Jane Doe has enrolled in your school. Take that family out to dinner, see what they want, and give it to them. All right? <laughs> You're facing litigation. So this is, this is the Doe case, and it's a dog, I call this dog v. dog allergy. And what the Department of Transportation here says is you got to do your best to accommodate both of these. You can't ignore either one of them. Uh, and so when we have a student who wants to bring a service animal to school, and we have a student who has a dog allergy, figure it out. <laughs> That's basically my official legal advice. Figure it out. Uh, but the, they're probably entitled to take that service animal and we want to protect the student with the dog allergy, so figure it out. And it's really case by case. What are we going to do with that? Um, Wisconsin had a lawsuit that went to the Seventh Circuit and it had to do with a kind of innovative, I, I think it's innovative, maybe Indiana has something like this as well, but this is an open enrollment law. This is a law that allows students to transfer from the district where they live to a district that they want to go to school in. So they're crossing district lines to go to a different school district. And they have a state law that permits this. The interesting thing about their state law is on the face of it, it discriminates on the basis of disability. 
Maybe I shouldn't say it discriminates, it treats them differently. The way it works in Wisconsin under this law is that when you receive applications for transfer, you put them in two separate piles. There's the pile of the kids who don't have an IEP, and there's the pile of the kids that do have an IEP. So they're automatically, right on the face of it, saying, we're going to treat the students with disabilities different from how we treat the other students. Doesn't that sound like discrimination? The court said that is not discrimination. And the reason the court said that is because disability is protected from discrimination, but it's different from other things that are protected from discrimination. Think about it. Now, with students, we don't worry about age. Age discrimination kicks in when you're 40 years old. But we do have protection from racial discrimination and sexual discrimination and religious discrimination and disability discrimination. But I would contend, and I think this court makes the point, one of those is different from the other three. You would never allow, the court would never allow a school district to say, uh, here's the applications we have from the Christian students, here's the application from we have from the non-Christian students. That wouldn't fly. They wouldn't say, here's the applications we have from the white students, here's the applications we have from black and brown students. They wouldn't allow that. But disability is different. Why? Because it has implications for how you serve that student. It has implications for budget, it has implications for personnel, it has implications for how you serve that student. So the way it works in Wisconsin under this law is that if I'm a fourth grader and I do not have an IEP and I apply for a transfer to another school, the only issue is do you have room? If I'm a fourth grader with an IEP, the issue is do I have room and do I have the capability of satisfying that IEP? So the court said that is different but not discriminatory. Kind of an interesting thing for lawmakers to think about. So taking disability into account is not always discriminatory. You know, the same thing's true with personnel. The same thing is true with personnel. With regard to race, sex, religion, we pretty much ignore those in the area of personnel. We're supposed to treat people the same regardless. Disability is different because we have to reasonably accommodate the person. How can you reasonably accommodate the visually impaired teacher without talking about what do we need to do to make you be an effective teacher despite the fact that you have a visual impairment? So you take it into account. So it's a little bit different from other kinds of uh, discrimination. So uh, after school programs, this is just another illustration of the fact that uh, the 504 and ADA applies to everything that the school is doing. So if we have an after school program, this one from Gloucester City, it's kind of an interesting illustration of what the school might have to do with regard to uh, uh, accommodating a student in the after school program, so that's the main thing. Well, I've spent quite a bit of time on ADA 504, hope we didn't spend too much time on that, but like I said right from the get-go, lots of litigation over this. And, uh, and I think that's going to continue. So let's talk about behavior. Now I'm going into behavior in mind-numbing detail uh, in two sessions later today. But let's hit the highlights with regard to some of these cases. Uh, notice a lot of cases permit some flexibility in when and how behavior is addressed. In the written materials, let's, I'm going to come back to the first case. But the second case, Cook versus Little Rock. The third case, Albright versus Mountain Home. The fourth case, SW versus Abington School District. All three of these cases are cases where the courts say, you do have to address behavior if it's impacting the student's education, but you have flexibility in how you do it. Uh, you don't necessarily have to write a formal behavior plan. There's lots of different ways of addressing the student's behavior. But I, I do think it's very clear uh, that you do have to address behavior proactively if the behavior is interfering with the student's education. Do you all have a question on your forms that says, does the student have behaviors that impede learning of the student or others? Does that language sound familiar to you? How many of you go to a lot of, let's say you call them CCC meetings, right? How many of you go to a lot of those? All right. And you have a written form, I understand, statewide? And, and I'll bet that form says, does the student have behaviors that impede the learning of the student or others? I'm sure you have that because federal law requires that you have that question. And if the CCC team checks yes, do you have a yes and a no box on that? I bet you do. Yep, you check yes, 
then you have to consider what are we going to do about that. You don't necessarily have to write a formal behavior plan, but the record of your discussion should reflect that the team then proceeded to discuss how will we address this. And so, uh, but a lot of cases tell us we have some flexibility in exactly how we're going to do that. Now, um, <clears throat> the first case in here is one of several I have in the material that has to do with the overuse of physical restraint. The overuse of physical restraint. Now, physical restraint uh, is permitted. Uh, but it, it should be used only when we have an emergency. And an emergency is generally when the use of physical restraint is necessary to prevent greater harm. All right? You have a student who has a baseball bat and appears to be ready to hit another student with it. Uh, and it looks like the only effective technique to prevent that from happening is physically grabbing one or the other of those students. That's a physical restraint. And I think it's justified because it's necessary to prevent greater harm. Uh, but we have several court cases that acknowledge, and these are in various states, and many states have their different rules and regulations about restraint. I did not research exactly what Indiana has, but uh, a lot of states have re rules and regulations about this. But I've never seen one that, that absolutely prohibits it. I don't think you can. And, and I recommend to schools that if a parent asks you that you, that to make a commitment that you will never use physical restraint, I don't think that's a commitment that you can make. We don't know, you know. We have some tragic situations that are happening in our schools, and sometimes the only way to prevent that is through physical restraint. But what several of these cases say is if you're using this too much, and nobody has quite defined what too much is, but I think you'll know it when, you, when you're doing it. If we're, if we're relying too much on physical restraint and other types of exclusion or seclusion, there's something wrong with our behavior plan. So address the behavior plan in a proactive way and keep physical restraint where it belongs, rare and only in an emergency. So this first uh, case on that, uh, in the behavior section, Pottsgrove, uh, the court said that they deployed uh, physical restraint dozens of times over three years. You know, the fact that it's going on over three years and we have to continue to do this indicates shouldn't we be doing something more proactive and positive with regard to a behavior plan? Are you all getting any complaints about bullying? Do we have assistant principals out here? All right. I love talking to assistant principals about life in general. You know, I think if all these... Well, I mean, because you guys are right where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. I, I've long maintained that if these polling organizations really want to get a good grasp on what's going on in America, they would quit doing these random surveys. They just interview assistant principals, as you guys know. How, how many, when was the last time you saw Ferris Bueller's Day Off? You know, when I talk to assistant principals, one of the first things I tell them is, you ought to watch that show just a second time, you know? You thought that was pretty funny, didn't you? <laughs> now you're an assistant principal. See if you don't see it from Ed Rooney's point of view. <laughs> you know, I watched that program. I think that was the most subversive movie in the last 50 years. You know, because I, you know, there were two people in that movie that understood what a con man Ferris was: his sister and Ed Rooney. And what does the movie do? Well, Ed is the buffoon. You know, we're just going to make fun of him. I, I, I saw that movie in exactly the wrong stage of life. I had children at, 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 you know, at that age. And Anyway, why do I bring that up with bullying? Assistant principals are hearing about this all the time, right? You know, the good thing about taking a problem out of the closet and bringing it into the light is we start to address it. It's good that we're addressing bullying. It's, it's long overdue and good for us for acknowledging this is, an, this is a problem. And the fact that it's always been a problem doesn't mean there's nothing we can do about it. So we brought it out of the closet. But we're hearing it an awful lot. And I hear from assistant principals, they hear this in the context of you call the parents to inform them of something that student A did, and they tell you, well, I know he shouldn't have done that, but you know they've been bullying him for the past six months. So we're hearing an awful lot of complaints about bullying, and they all have to be investigated, they all have to be taken seriously, and some of them end up in court. Now, the lawyers have coined a term here. It's called bully side cases. And those are cases where the bullying culminates in the suicide of a student. And so we have quite a bit of litigation 
over uh, that scenario where a student has actually gotten so desperate that they ended their life and then the family sues the school district alleging that the school district uh, turned a blind eye to a long campaign of bullying. This is another place where the term deliberate indifference comes up. And, and that's the hardest thing for parents to prove. You know, in a case like this, th these are called student to student harassment cases. So the school didn't directly harm anybody, but the allegation is that the school should have done more than it did. So they have to prove that bullying occurred. That's not too hard to prove. They have to prove the bullying was really bad. It wasn't just a simple case of name calling. It was really pretty bad. They have to prove that the school knew about it. None of those things are too hard to prove, frankly. The hard thing to prove is that the school was deliberately indifferent. And here's where your response to bullying and your documentation of your response is so important. Uh, we never know the cases that are going to end up in litigation. Uh, so the lawyers are always advising you, document, document, document. And I know you get tired of that. Everybody has too much paperwork. But if we end up in litigation over something like this, the record of what did you know, when did you know it, and what did you do about it, that's going to become quite critical. Uh, so that's what a lot of these cases are about. Now, this, this case from Houston is one, uh, again, our firm wasn't involved in this one, but I, I, I really like this case because it illustrates one of the main points I try, always try to emphasize when I talk about special ed law, and that is what I call the unwritten rule. I think, and I know we got hearing officers here, and so maybe some of them can verify this uh, afterwards, but I think that there's an unwritten standard that hearing officers and judges apply when they're hearing a case involving a dispute between the parents and the school. And that unwritten rule is we're going to kind of assess who's being more reasonable here. Who is acting more like the adult in the room. And I think that's probably true about litigation of all kinds, but it's particularly true with regard to special ed. Because you think about this. This entire system is built on a foundation that assumes good faith collaboration between parents and school. The whole thing's built on that. The IEP team, which you call the CCC, is a collaborative effort between people who all want the same thing. We all want the student to be successful. Uh, and so we've got parents and school people coming together for a common effort and, and, and are expected to work collaboratively. And, uh, some and usually they do. And sometimes they don't. And sometimes they work collaboratively, but they have a falling out, and there ends up in litigation. I think when it ends up in litigation, that hearing officer is always kind of quietly assessing who, who, who acted collaboratively, who tried to make it work, who didn't. And this is a good case, because this case in Houston is not really illegal. They, they weren't fighting over the law. They were fighting over the facts. Here's what happened. The parents alleged that the student had been subjected to bullying at the school. But bullying wasn't really the legal issue here. They said he was sub subjected to bullying and therefore he didn't come to school for about four months. I think it was like February to June, the student did not attend school. The issue really was who's responsible for that, all right? So it was the missed school that was the real issue. Now, the parents claimed that the school was callous and unresponsive in, in, in response to the, their con concerns about bullying. And the school said, no, we did a lot of things to try to get the student back in to school. Now, look at the quote that we have here, the, the key quote from the Fifth Circuit. This one worked its way all the way to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. The court said, from February to June, CJ's teacher communicated with his parents nearly 30 times. How's the judge know? that the teacher communicated with him nearly 30 times? That's because the teacher testified to that, and the teacher probably has some record to back that up. Document, document, document. The teacher communicated nearly 30 times, uh, attempting to convince them to return him to school. Administrators arranged for CJ's teacher to meet him at the car when his parents dropped him off to escort him inside the school building so he would feel safe. School officials offered to allow CJ to spend the first hour of the day in the Office of Student Support to ease his transition. This does not sound like a school that is non-responsive to a kid who's afraid he's going to get bullied. 
These facts belie the parents' claim that teachers and school administrators were callous and unresponsive to CJ's fears about bullying. Considering CJ's parents' failure to follow up with the requested paperwork for five weeks, the parents wanted homebound. The school said, here, fill out this paperwork, get it back to us. They sat on it for five weeks. That, that matters. That matters. Uh, and considering further the school's repeated outreach and offers of accommodation, the school district's behavior was reasonable. That's the unwritten rule. That's the unwritten rule. This is a factual dispute. You know, everybody agrees the students missed an awful lot of school. That's not good. Who's responsible for that? And, and in this case, the court sided with the school. Now, there's cases where the courts find that the school acted unreasonably. And when the school acts unreasonably, frequently it's because we're stuck in the past. Uh, we're not willing to consider doing something we've never done before. Uh, it's that type of thing. And sometimes it's this lack of communication. We're going to bump into some cases where I think if you understand how schools work, it was a simple miscommunication. But it comes across as unreasonable. So uh, that, that to me is a real good illustration of that unwritten rule. Okay? Child fine. Now a lot of cases about this. Uh, you know, and I think child fine is one of the most innovative and important parts of our special education law. You know, uh, you all have uh, parents that, that I, I describe as the MSPs and the LSPs. Now that's an acronym you haven't heard. We've got a lot of acronyms in special ed. You know, I learned that early on. I, in fact, I have a quiz. How many of you consider yourself to be special ed types? Well, you're not sure what I mean by that. So let me, let me Let's, let, let's have you take the quiz right now. So here, here, here's how it is. You have to listen to this story and tell me if you recognize all the acronyms. So I got a call from a school district early on and they said, we got this kid that he's not doing very well. Um, we've tried a lot of special programs. He doesn't seem to fit anywhere. We're not quite sure what to do. Do you have any ideas? And I said, by this time, I've been doing special ed law for a while. I said, well, it sounds to me like you thought the kid might be E-D-L-D-O-H-I due to A-D-D, A-D-H-D. I'm sure you wanted to come up with an IEP, place him in the LRE, probably considered E-S-Y, O-T-P-T, -T, and other A-T-Ds. <laughs> I expected you F-I-E'd him, you I-E-P'd him, you 504'd him, you D-N-Q'd him. I'd say the K-I-D is O-U-T. <laughs> How many of you got 80% of that? <laughs> you are a special ed type, all right? Okay. So, uh, so, how did I get into that? Oh, MSPs, LSPs, what's that? You won't find that in the literature. What's an MSP? That's your most sophisticated parent. <laughs> you can figure out what the LSP is, okay? <laughs> most school districts serve parents that cross the spectrum. Child fine is for that less sophisticated parent. Now, the more sophisticated parents are, have the benefit of child fine, but frankly, they don't need it that much. They read up on stuff, they know, they're gonna to come to the school and ask for help. Child fine is about leveling this playing field a little bit. Some parents don't know about disability, some parents are not well educated, some parents don't speak English, some parents are not legally supposed to be here. All of the children of those parents are entitled to a free appropriate public education. So we level the playing field with child fine. It's a wonderful law but it leads to a lot of litigation. Now Galveston, this Galveston case, every time we have a case from Texas, I want to say, we didn't handle this one either. <laughs> but, uh, but this one, they lost the records. This kid was in Galveston ISD until the parents pulled him out and homeschooled him for a few years. Then she came back four years later. She'd never been dismissed from special ed. The record should have been somewhere. And, and the school failed to uh, initiate a referral for the student. Now, you read a case like that and you think, well, shouldn't the parents have told the school? Maybe, but child fine is an obligation of the school district. And so the school district, you know, the lesson of that case is just don't lose the records. Prior written notice is your best friend. A lot of cases about this. Let's take a look at this. Uh, let's just walk through some of these. Spring Branch ISD versus OW. The, uh, the court here said that by October 8th, the school had enough information that they should have initiated evaluation and they didn't start it until January the 15th. October, November, December, January, three months later. The court said that's too long. This court said this is four months. I think it's three. November, December, it's three. Uh, by October, the student, now here's what had happened by October 8th. What triggers child fine? By October 8th, the student had been sent to the principal's office five times. That's a frequent flyer, isn't it? was failing a majority of his classes despite his gifted intellect. 
District was on notice that he had ADHD and the mother had requested an evaluation. Forget the rest, the mother had requested an evaluation. What do you do when the mother or the father requests an evaluation? You do one of two things, it's very simple. You either do the evaluation or you give a written notice called a prior written notice explaining why you're not going to do the evaluation. Those are the only two legally defensible options. That's all you can do, okay? So it's pretty simple. So I'm the parent, I ask for an evaluation. I should walk out of there with some pieces of paper. You should either say, okay, Mr. Walsh, here's our consent form. Please sign this, we'll start the process. That's one response. And if you give me that consent form, you should also give me your state procedural safeguards document so I'm informed of my rights. The other option is, uh, no, I don't think we're gonna do the evaluation right now, but here's a document we call prior written notice that explains in great detail why we're not gonna do it. And here is your procedural safeguards document, which explains that you can challenge this decision. Those are your only two options, okay? They didn't do either of those, in this case from Spring Branch. Now the next one, they also didn't do that, but they, but they got away with it. This is Canijo Valley from California. Uh, there was a conversation between the mother and the principal on the day before the student started kindergarten. Mother later said, you know, I asked for an IEP right then. Principal said, no, I don't remember the conversation that way. And the principal produced contemporaneous documentation to back it up. Principal had sent an email to the mother that very day and, and, and referenced a lot, a lot of things and didn't say anything about this. But let's read in the italics here. Uh, the, the school district, after this meeting, they had a, a student support meeting. Now, do you all call it that? You have RTI, right? Or multi-tier systems of support. You're doing all that. And all of that is designed to jack up the level of services for the student who's not in special ed so that we don't have to put them in special ed. And that's all a good thing. But you should still either do the evaluation or give the prior written notice right then. They had this student support team. Later in the year, they had another student support team and then they had a third student support team. And at the third meeting, they said, okay, let's do an evaluation of this child. You know, if they had called me for legal advice, I would have said, well, this is fine and good, but that mother has requested, she, she said she's requested an evaluation, prior written notice or consent to do the evaluation, one or the other. Um, so, so it's your BFF, your best friend forever there. How long should RTI last? Now somebody, uh, Mitch, are you talking about that? Is Mitch gonna talk about this? So maybe he'll tell you, you know, eight months and four days. I don't know. But all I know from this case is 16 months is too long. That's what this court said, 16 months is too long. Uh, so, our, you know, they probably should have some standards for how long this lasts. Uh, child find cases, parents don't always win. They didn't win in Alamo Heights. This is a case where, this is a high achieving student. Uh, this is a bright student. He's in mostly advanced placement classes. He's doing quite well in Alamo Heights School District and, uh, and the request for evaluation did not happen until the 10th grade. You'll notice the handout here says that he had done well on the STAR test. That's our statewide accountability uh, system. And, uh, and so the court said there was no basis for the school to suspect a disability here. This is a case where when the parent did request an evaluation, they did it. But the parent then said, well, you should, have, you should have started this long before, child fine. Court said, no, we don't see evidence that the school was on notice of that. It's a case here from Chicago of a student who was doing very poorly on their state accountability test. He, uh, he was, uh, and then they used these as factors to consider promotion from one grade to the next. But it only applied to promotion to the seventh grade. Sixth grade to seventh grade, you had to score at a certain level on this test. Well, fourth and fifth grade, it didn't factor into it, but his scores were abysmally low. And the court said, you know, that matters. That, I mean, we do this standardized testing for a reason, and that matters. And so it should be taken into account uh, in terms of whether or not we have a child fine situation. Uh, <clears throat> the Copper's Cove case, down at the bottom of page eight. <clears throat> okay, you should take that one and scratch it out. Things change, things go up on appeal. This case got a lot of attention. Do y'all have kids with dyslexia in Indiana? I bet you do. Do you have any confusion about how exactly to serve the student with dyslexia? I'll bet you do. This is a judge who took a very simplistic approach. He looked at the federal definition of uh, specific learning disability, and you know it gives some examples of things that can constitute a specific learning disability. Guess what? Dyslexia is listed there. 
So he said, if your screening shows that the student has dyslexia, that kid's eligible. You don't have to do all this fancy testing. You don't have to figure out if there's a, you don't have to do a cross battery assessment. You don't have to figure out if there's a pattern of strengths and weaknesses. Your screening shows dyslexia, that kid is eligible, write an IEP. That's the way this judge found, saw it. Just very recently, this one went up on the, to the Fifth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit reversed it. And what they said was, judge, you completely ignored educational need. Now that's a term we use in Texas. Do you all use that term? You know, there's two, there's two factors that make you eligible for special education. You have to have one of the disabilities that's in the law and then you have to need special education in order to address that disability. And we generally call that educational need. This judge in the case from Copper's Cove um, ignored educational need. And so now I think it's pretty simple. If you have dyslexia, you're in. And the Fifth Circuit said no. And that's true of every single disability there is out there, you know. Uh, there has to be an educational need of some sort. So. Uh, that one, so you can scratch it out in the written materials. That one changed when it went up to the Fifth Circuit. Okay, so let's talk about discipline a little bit. So there's a group of kids that I call the shoulda known kids. This is a term that's not in the law. <laughs> Should be, don't you think? Isn't that a better term than deemed to have knowledge? That's the way they wrote it in the law. You're deemed to have knowledge. You don't talk that way at the dinner table. You know, what you say is, we should have known. And so I call these the shoulda known kids. These are students who are not in your special education program and yet they are entitled to the protections of the special ed law. Let's let that sink in for a second. You know in discipline there's some, there's some rules that apply to the discipline of special ed students that do not apply to the other students. And so once the student is declared eligible for special ed, we know that all that stuff applies. The shoulda known kids are those who are not yet in there but they are entitled to the protections. This first case from uh, Panama Buena Vista School District in California is a good illustration of this. The parents said, this is a should have known kid. And at first he was, because what happened? The parent requested an evaluation on September 15th, and the events leading to expulsion occurred after that. That makes you a should have known kid. So <clears throat> let's say that, let's say that, uh, are we playing football this Friday night? Okay. Let's say that a parent is, uh, today, as we sit here on, what is today, Thursday? What is today? Wednesday. Today, a parent in your school district is requesting a special ed evaluation, and they're doing it exactly the right way. Pursuant to uh, 20 U.S.C. 1401 ETSEC, I hereby request a full initial individual evaluation of my child to determine eligibility under the Individuals Disabilities Education Act. All right. So you get that today. Friday, that student uh, brings a six-pack of beer to your football game. I'm guessing that violates your code of conduct, doesn't it? Even if the student shares it with the principal? <laughs> That's a should have known kid because the request for evaluation, think of it this way, that kid's in the pipeline towards special ed. He's in the pipeline. And once he's in the pipeline, he's, protect, he's entitled to the protections of the special ed law. So this kid was in that pipeline, and yet what happened was, it says that on September 22nd, just one week after the request, the district said, okay, we'll do the evaluation, and gave the parent the consent form to sign, and she never signed it. And they gave it to her in both Spanish and English, because this is a parent who was kind of going back and forth between the two languages, so they were careful. And okay, here it is in Spanish, here it is in English. She didn't sign either one of them. So he was in the pipeline. Mother took him out of the pipeline by not signing the consent. Now, it, uh, so that's, that's, that's how that works. That's what uh, we mean by the should have known kids. Uh, the Olu Cole case from charter school. By the way, I understand we have a lot of charter schools in Indiana. Uh, here's the deal about charter schools. Uh, they are creations of the state. So Indiana can establish that we want to have charter schools and they can exempt charter schools from whatever state laws they choose to exempt them from. So charter schools typically have a little more flexibility than the traditional public school has with regard to a lot of things. However, 
charter schools cannot be exempted from anything in the special education law because it comes from the feds. So the charter schools have the exact same responsibility to provide the exact same level of services to a student who enrolls in a charter school as they would if they were in a traditional school. So when a charter school suggests or tells a parent, you know, we really don't have the services that your child needs here, uh, they're on thin ice. But most parents don't know that. And so a lot, I think that conversation happens fairly often. And those kids end up back at the traditional public school because they think that, well, the traditional public school has to provide the services. So does the charter school. A lot of parents don't know that. So uh, I think we're going to see more litigation in the future about charter schools. So this one I mentioned in the uh, materials here, I mentioned the toolbox. And this is just a plug for a session I'm doing later today. Uh, one of the sessions I'm doing is what I call the toolbox. And the toolbox is my effort to try to make this very complex area of special ed discipline understandable. And so I created what I call the toolbox. I do a lot of workshops uh, uh, about this, uh, mainly for special ed types and principals and assistant principals. And we break it down into 10 specific tools that are available to the school. Because what you're doing in special ed discipline, the bottom line is you're trying to accomplish two things at the same time. And it's difficult to do both of them. You're trying to maintain a safe school environment, safe and good environment for everybody. And you're trying to serve in the least restrictive environment students who sometimes are very disruptive and or violent. You got to do those at the same time. That's difficult. So the toolbox is my effort to break it down into 10 specific tools. In this charter school case from District of Columbia, they ordered the removal of the student for 45 days because the student inflicted serious bodily injury on another student. Schools can do that. In my toolbox, I call that tool number five, removal for special circumstances. But the school tried to extend it beyond that. And this one actually, this is another one that went up on appeal and the, and the uh, Court of Appeals had a little different take on this. They said the school has to prove that, keep, that maintaining this student in the current placement is gonna cause serious bodily, or uh, substantial risk of injury. So uh, they reversed that one. So anyway, we'll talk about that in the toolbox presentation. Spring Branch, this is another excessive use of restraint in police uh, case, and so I just want to point that out. Manifestation dirt termination sometimes can be done exactly right. Rose Tree Media case on page 11 of your materials is a good example of that. Uh, the district conducted the manifestation properly. They did it carefully. And we listen to the facts of this case. This is kind of interesting. It's a very violent attack. And it was caught on video. This happened in the lunchroom, and they have videos in the lunchroom. So this is all on video. Uh, he smashed another student's face into, the, into his lunch on the cafeteria table, then landed a fist punch, broke the other kid's nose and eye socket, and uh, caused a collapsed nasal cavity and concussion. I'd call that a serious bodily injury. Uh, so, but, you know, you, you read that and you think, well, you know, obviously that's not a manifestation. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it is a manifestation of disability. The school took it quite seriously. The psychologist, it says here, spent three to four hours reviewing the records. Two members of the team reviewed the videos. The student had attention deficit. He also had a learning disability. The team said, you know, we, this student planned to do this. This was not an impulsive attention deficit type of thing. They took it seriously. They didn't, make, they did, they didn't base their manifestation on the, on the level of violence. That's not what it's about. It's not about how serious the violation was. It's about is it a manifestation of disability. So manifestation determination is all about making sure that we don't punish a student for having a disability. That's why we do it. We don't want to punish a student for having a disability. When I say that, you know, it's pretty obvious. I mean, we'd never punish a student because she happens to be blind. But the same thing applies to the student who is emotionally disturbed and acts in ways that are a direct result of that emotional disturbance. That's why we do manifestation determinations. Okay, <clears throat> this Montori case, I uh, found it interesting. Uh, Dr. Folks got up here this morning and talked about the concern about teachers not taking IEPs seriously. Uh, you know, if that's a persistent problem in your school district, I think it's not the teachers at fault, it's the principal. Uh, you know, you may have a uh, renegade teacher somewhere, but if you have a persistent problem with this over the years, I'm looking at the principal. I think this problem is solvable. Write up one teacher. 
for the failure to implement the IEP and then let the teacher's lounge do the rest of the work for you. I have been invited, I've done exactly what you said. I've been the lawyer that's been invited to put the fear of the law in them. I don't think I'm all that effective at it. I mean, I do my best, but I, I, the principal can make the difference on this. Write up one teacher. Doesn't have to be harsh, just something that says, you know, this is really an important professional responsibility. Uh, looking at what you've done, it looks to me like you have not faithfully implemented this IEP as called for, and uh, you know, you need to not do this anymore. Let the teacher's lounge do the rest of the work for you from there, okay? Uh, so, <clears throat> all right, so let's see, where are we? Uh, Success Academy, that's another charter school that has some kind of interesting observations. We'll leave it at that. East Whittier said the student is not eligible because he's not deaf. And the court said, well, you didn't consider whether or not he's hearing impaired. Those are two different things. I had forgotten that. They are. There's deaf and then there's hearing impaired. They're two separate things. And so if you're going to say the student is eligible and you're concerned about hearing, you might want to look at both. Perry Zerkel is going to be here. Uh, Perry's a wonderful person. He's a professor at Lehigh University, and he is a prolific writer to the Office of Special Ed Programs. This, these are like epistles. It's like the letter to the Zerkelians. Uh, there's a whole bunch of these. The only person who writes to OSEP more than Perry Zerkel is anonymous. But there's a, a, there's a lot of letters to Zerkel. And so uh, his question here is, do we have to do response to intervention? And I found the answer interesting. They said, well, no, you really don't. It's kind of up to your state. But look at this. They said this in the middle of page 13 in my materials. They say, you do have to have database documentation of repeated assessments of achievement at reasonable intervals reflecting formal assessment of student progress during instruction which was provided to the child's parents. That to me is RTI. That's what that is. So that they, they kind of say, well no, you, you don't have to use it to determine eligibility, but you do have to have this data. How are you going to get this data if you're not providing MTSS or RTI something now this is talking specifically about learning disabilities because one of the characteristics of learning disability is you have to be underachieving. And so we want to verify that the underachievement is not due to the lack of appropriate instruction. Uh, I've heard some people say some kids don't have dyslexia, they have dystautia. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> You know, I learned about learning disability from special ed directors and, you know, early on, I, I think I was like most people. I think if you took a survey of your friends who are not in education but are well-educated, college-educated people, but they're not in the world of education, and ask them, what do you think the term learning disability means? And I bet over 50% of them say, oh, this, didn't we used to call that mentally retarded? Isn't that what that is? That's a Down syndrome child? No. <laughs> But I think that's what, that's what I thought. I think that's what most people think. So I, I learned this from a special ed director. She called me, she said, we got this kid, and, he, he, uh, and she described the situation, and I said, well, is he learning disabled? And she said, oh, he's not smart enough to be learning disabled. I said, what? He said, he's not smart enough to be learning disabled. I said, well, how smart do you have to be? And then she started talking about, you know, it's an, it's an underachievement compared to your age or your ability. And so th there has to be a certain level of intelligence. And, and the regulations say that. You can't be intellectually disabled and learning disabled at the same time. And so, uh, so that's what she said. I said, well, you don't tell the parents that, do you? I mean, when you're talking to a parent, do you say your boy's not smart enough to be learning disabled? She said, oh, no. Uh, she was a sweet girl from East Texas. She said, I just say his bucket ain't big enough. And I thought, that's good. <laughs> and they'd always wrap it up with bless his heart, you know. <laughs> Hint for you, you go to East Texas, what we call behind the pine cone curtain. They think they can say whatever they want about you as long as they wrap it up with bless his heart. You know? <laughs> I hear you got a new superintendent. He is dumb as a box of rocks. Bless his heart. <laughs> So you want to be careful about that. Uh, Iowa, caution to the Indiana Department of Education, the Iowa Department of Education was held responsible for a significant amount of attorney's fees because they provided inaccurate guidance on eligibility. Kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so I'll just leave that the way it is. Uh, and let's see, what do we have for ISD? Oh, ISD uh, 283. There's several cases like this in my materials, and I'm running a little bit behind schedule here, so I'm going to 
pick up the pace a little bit, but there's several of them that make the point that the failure to attend school is a real good indicator of educational need. And sometimes, in fact, several of the cases in my materials are bright students who are not going to school. And the school says, well, they're not eligible, they're just not coming to school. And the courts kind of have a tendency to turn that around. So the fact that they're not coming to school may be connected to a disability. And it certainly indicates that maybe there's an educational need. Uh, so that, that's uh, what that one is about. Okay, evaluations. Uh, Lawrence County School District, this sounds like one of those cases where some of the staff said, well, he can't possibly be eligible. He's, you know, he's very bright. He's taking advanced placement classes. We don't want to say that. You know, I, I like to eliminate the words never and always from discussions of special ed, at, at least as pertaining to the law. I used to do a presentation called 10 Things Not to Say at an IEP Meeting. And I thought it was chock full of good advice. And, uh, but one of them was, you know, we need to avoid never and always. We always do it this way. Uh, in fact, I have, let me give you my standard response when the parent makes a request that you don't quite know how to respond to it, but you feel a little anxiety in your gut about the request. What do you do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a formula for a response that I think is legally proper and, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. So a parent asks for something and, and you, you know, it's something we've never done before. You're pretty sure your superintendent doesn't really want you to do this. Um, well, how do you respond? Here's how you respond. You say, you know, we will have the IEP team take a look at the evaluation data to determine if that is something your child needs in order to receive a free appropriate public education. And if the IEP team determines that your child needs it, then we will figure out a way to provide it. Now let me say that again and let me emphasize the four key factors. I will ask the IEP team to take a look at this. That's very important that we start with that. This decision is what the student needs is not going to be determined by the principal or the special ed director, or the superintendent, or the school lawyer, or the school board. Uh -uh. I'm going to have the IEP team take a look at this. I'm going to ask the IEP team to look at the evaluation data. Evaluation data is to your CCC as evidence is to a jury. All decisions of the CCC about what goes into the IEP should be reflective of, of the evaluation data that we have. So component one. I'm going to tell the parent who's going to make this call. I'm going to have the IEP team look at this. I'm going to have them review the eval component two. What are they going to base it on? Evaluation data. And then component three, what's the criteria? Need. Need for what? Need for free appropriate public education. Now that may sound like kind of a vague answer, but it's absolutely legally proper because that's what the law requires. All right. You look back at some of the early cases, some of the early cases in special ed dealt with things like extended school year. Think about that. We provide, what, 175, 180 days of education, and we provide it to every student from the, 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 you know, the top of the line, gifted and talented, advanced placement student to the student with severe disabilities. Uh, so we're providing equal, right? It's all equal. Everybody gets the same number of days. Then we had some parents who came in and said, well, I think my child needs 12 months of education. And the gut reaction was, well, no, that's unfair. That's unequal. We do equal. You know, everybody gets the same number of days. If the schools had said, we will have the IEP team take a look at the evaluation to see if your child needs that in order to receive a free appropriate public education, you know what the answer would have been? That kid needs that in order to receive a free appropriate public education. So therefore we have to do it. So you know, if you're asked to do something you've never done before, I'm in favor of acknowledging that. You know, let's not try to hide the ball. Uh, parents are pretty smart. You know, let's say, you know, we've never done that before. But we're gonna have the IEP team take a look at the evaluation data. If that's what your kid needs, we'll figure it out. We'll find a way to make it work. So, <clears throat> so there we have it. The Albright, here's another illustration of the unwritten rule. Uh, this is a case where I'll just call your attention to the footnote where the court basically says there's no way the school could have satisfied this parent without doing everything that the parent wanted and that's not the way the rule is, the system is designed to work, so there you do it. Uh, Escondido, this is, a, this is an interesting one to me. 
down at the bottom of page 15. The four month delay in assessing a student for autism denied FAPE to the student. So they, they delayed four months. Well, what happened? Did I read this? And I think this is so understandable in a busy school. The child's private therapist informed the team in December that she had already done an evaluation. And she said, this kid's on the spectrum. He does have some uh, characteristics of autism. And she says, I'll give it to the parent and the parent will bring it to you. Okay, well that sounds good. And the school can use that evaluation if they want to, to determine eligibility. So the school holds off on doing its own evaluation. Can't you just imagine this happening? And then what happened? It just slipped through the cracks. Nobody was consciously, you know, but everybody's busy. And it slipped through the cracks. I don't know if the private therapist never gave it to the mom or the mom never gave it to the school, but it never got to the school. And four months go by and the child's not been evaluated. And didn't we all agree that the child needs to be evaluated? And four months have gone by and the child's not been evaluated. Now, whose fault is that? Well, the school said, parent. Court said, child finds your responsibility. So, you know, I read this and I think, boy, I can so easily see this happening. Everybody acting in good faith, everybody busy. Just slip through the cracks. Child find is the school's responsibility. Okay. <clears throat> Attendance uh, again, that Rose Tree case. Okay, SCOTUS. Do you all know the term SCOTUS? Everybody on the count of three say SCOTUS. One, two, three. SCOTUS. Little enthusiasm. One, two, three. SCOTUS. See, I want you to walk away from this conference. This is the first special ed law conference, and at a minimum, I want you to walk it away with the language that establishes your street cred with your <laughs> nephew who just started law school. This is what the cool kids call the Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS. So, uh, we have a number of uh, SCOTUS rulings with regard to free, appropriate public education. Uh, <clears throat> now, give you a little background on this. This goes all the way back to 1982. That's the first time that the Supreme Court attempted to define what we mean by a free, appropriate public education. And they did it in the case involving Amy Rowley. And those of you who have been to conferences like this, you've heard about this case for a long time. And what the court said in that case, that, uh, that you, you, you don't have to provide the best possible education. That is a standard that schools could never satisfy. Uh, but you have to provide one that is designed to confer some educational benefit. Some educational benefit. Now, that is a very vague standard. In the Amy Rowley case, the court was dealing with a very bright, hearing impaired little girl who was in a mainstream classroom and satisfying grade level standards and by all accounts one of the top students in her class. And she's going to get promoted from first grade to second grade and everybody expects she's going to be successful, which in fact she is. She, I think she's got a, I've heard she's a, got a master's degree and speaks at conferences like this now. So the court said, you know, with a kid like that, with a kid like that who has a disability, the system itself kind of tells us how we're doing. The system itself monitors. We have regular grades, we have regular testing, we have regular feedback. And if this student is advancing from first grade to second grade on time, from ninth grade to tenth grade on time, graduating on time, meeting the same standards as the rest of the kids, then obviously you're providing a free appropriate public education. So that's what we had in 1982. 35 years later, Andrew F. comes up. Now, let's talk about the other kids. There are students in our special ed program like Amy Rowley. Very bright students, no cognitive problem, mainstream, regular grades, regular classroom. This is a lower functioning student, and the question is, what does FAPE mean for a kid like Andrew? I was, I was you know, you can listen to the oral arguments in these cases, and I did that. And I, so I heard the lawyer for Andrew describe him, and he said, Your Honor, he's not on grade level. He probably never will be. He's a pretty low functioning student. What's, what's it mean? He's not, he's not advancing from grade to grade. He's not meeting the same standards as everybody else, and he never will. And so what's FAPE mean for him? And here's what the court came up with. Progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. Now that clears it up for you, doesn't it? That's it. That's the best they could do. Here's the deal. In the 35 years between these two cases, courts tried to determine what some educational benefit means. Some of them said it's significant. Some of them said it's meaningful. Some of them said it's more than de minimis, which is Latin for a little bit. All of these are very vague terms. You know, you ask, you ask your child to go to the kitchen and fix you a bowl and, of ice cream. And you say, I want, I want some ice cream. Would you give me some ice cream? 
and they come back with a de minimis amount of ice cream. And you say, I'll tell you I wanted some ice cream. So well, I gave you some ice cream. You see my point? Very vague, very subjective. Uh, so in this case, and this is Justice Roberts, by the way, progr uh, he's a Hoosier. Did you know that? Justice Roberts? I mean, he wasn't born here. He's born in Buffalo. I just looked this up yesterday. He's born in Buffalo, but educated here in uh, Indiana until uh, he went to Harvard. Uh, so he's an Indiana, uh, Indiana guy. He's the, he's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he wanted this case. This was a unanimous decision of the Supreme Court. When that's the case, when the Chief Justice is in the majority, he gets to choose who writes the opinion. He wanted this one, and he wrote it. And I have great respect for him. I think he's a very brilliant person, and I think he's a very good writer. And this is the best he could come up with. And so I'm, I'm not making fun. I'm saying I don't think anybody can do any better. Progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So this is what we have. Now, they also said some other things in this case. Justice Roberts said, you know, but regardless of where the child is on the spectrum of ability, that kid deserves to have an IEP that's appropriately ambitious for that kid and has challenging objectives. Now, I think that's language that we should be hearing at your CCC meetings. I think you should bring that language right into your CCC meetings as you develop an IEP for a child. So a lot of courts have dealt with the uh, issue, is, it, is, it, is this Andrew really a game changer? And most courts that have addressed it have said no. Uh, most of us said this is already consistent with the standards we had. And that's really of more concern to the lawyers than to you all, so I'm going to go past that right now. But we have a number of cases after Andrew that are also dealing with students that are below grade level. And the courts, and a lot of these have worked their way up to the circuit courts. The courts have consistently said that for such students, slow progress is good progress. Slow progress may be progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. Grade level goals are not always appropriate. Sometimes a grade level goal is overly ambitious. We are supposed to be appropriately ambitious. But sometimes we might aim too high. And that's not the right thing to do either. So uh, I really like this case from the Third Circuit. It's in your materials. Uh, the parents cited a letter that the, off that the federal government put out in 2015. And that letter said that uh, your annual goal should be sufficiently ambitious to close the gap between the present level of performance and the grade level. And I heard that a lot for a few years. I heard that a lot at conferences. The implication seemed to be that if special educators did what they were supposed to do, we'd get everybody up to grade level. You know, and this was when we were in the No Child Left Behind Act testing phase where we were testing just about everybody at grade level. And this uh, Third Circuit Court said, you know, that letter, I don't know where they got that, but that's not in the law. That is not in the law. The law does not require that you close the gap between students of different ability levels uh, with appropriate services, but at the same time we're supposed to uh, provide services that are appropriately ambitious. So here's my suggestion. When you're preparing annual goals, you know, I, I, th I really think we make the whole IEP process more complicated than it ought to be. Uh, it's a goal-setting process, and so it's no different from other goal-setting processes. And I suspect that in this room there are many people who have had goals for themselves that deal with weight or money. I mean, most of us have. And they're easy to deal with because they involve numbers. All right? You're going to the high school reunion in six months. You start by establishing present levels of performance. You face the naked truth. And you write, and you write down the number. And then you say, OK, six months from now, I want to be 15 pounds less. That's the measurable goal. And then you write your IEP. Here are the things I'm going to do, and here are the things I'm going to refrain from doing in order to achieve that goal. An IEP is supposed to be pretty much the same thing. And so here's my suggestion. The chair of the meeting ought to eyeball. When you put a goal up, are you all projecting IEPs up on the wall so everybody can see them? I've been to some meetings where they do that, and I think that's a real good technique. So we're not just having somebody write it down where nobody can see, but projecting on the wall. Here is the proposed goal for language arts. Here's the proposed goal for self-help skills, toileting or uh, hygiene or whatever. Uh, and, and then you, you, you put that goal up where everybody can see it and ask yourself, do you think uh, 
that these goals are appropriately ambitious for this child? Are they appropriately ambitious? And then, then you describe the services needed to achieve the goal. Think about this for a second. If every single child in your school district achieves 100% mastery of every single goal on every single IEP, I'm going to say you were not appropriately ambitious. If you're appropriately ambitious, some of them are going to fall short. I mean, that's just common sense. So I like the language that Justice Roberts came up with appropriately ambitious, and I think that ought to be, uh, we ought to work that into our IEP uh, meetings. Bonus slide. This one's not in your materials. I just added this one. Uh, sure enough, some lawyers, lawyers are smart, and lawyers representing some parents in a case in the First Circuit said that the standard for FAPE is appropriately ambitious. The court said no, no. The standard is progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. Appropriately ambitious is an aspirational goal. So this to me is a real good illustration of the distinction between language that the educators ought to use and language that the lawyers ought to use. The educators should be talking about an appropriately ambitious IEP. If we end up in court, let your lawyer argue that, Your Honor, it was, it was appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. There's a difference there, okay? All right, four steps on an IEE. I'll just go through these four steps and, and let you read these cases for yourself. Parent brings you a report from an outside source. Four steps. Say thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's simple. Uh, say thank you. You know. Now you guys get all sorts of things. You get a full comprehensive report from a dyslexia expert. Thank you. You get a little scratch pad from a doctor prescribing 405 services. Right? <laughs> <laughs> say thank you. All right? Anytime the parent brings you information that tells you something about this student that we're trying to serve, let's say thank you. That's step one. Step two, ask for consent to speak to the person who wrote the report. Why do you need consent? Because you can't talk to that person without disclosing confidential information about the child. So, so thank you for this report from Dr. Big Brain. We'd like to talk to Dr. Big Brain. We, and we, but we can't do it without your consent. Would you please sign this so that our staff will feel comfortable contacting Dr. Big Brain to ask a few questions about the testing that she did. Third step, engage in mild cross-examination. Now some of you may think, well, we don't know how to do that. We didn't go to law school. Ah, oh, you do too. You know how to do it. How many of you have been married for more than two years? <laughs> how many of you have adolescents? You know, some of you are highly skilled at cross-examination, and everybody knows how to do it. What do I mean by mild cross-examination? It is not Tom Cruise to Jack Nicholson. It is, it, is, it is just, you know, when did you do this testing? What test specifically did you do? How much time did you spend with the child? Where? Have you ever observed the child in the educational setting? Uh, who was present when you interviewed the child? Have you talked to any of the teachers about the services that we're providing? If it ends up in court, these are the first questions your lawyer is going to ask that person. They should not be offended. We are responsible for the quality of the evaluation data. Parent brings us a report, they want us to rely on it. We need to verify that this report, we need to give it its proper weight. What do you do if the parent says, well, I don't see any reason why I need to talk to the doctor. The doctor's report speaks for itself. Well, you know, we get a lot of reports from a lot of people. We have to weigh the quality and the weight of the report. And if we can't ask a few follow-up questions, we just can't give it the level of weight that you might want us to. I think that's the answer to that. So those are the first three steps. And the fourth step is regardless of whether you get to do the cross-exam, bring it to the IEP team meeting and give it consideration. So those are our four responses. Now, I know there's another deal is, you know, do we pay for it or not? Now, there's some cases in the materials that talk about that, and I'm going to leave it at that. So, let's see. Yeah. Oh, I got to get, I get carried away talking about special ed law. So, here it is, 940, and yeah, we got a lot of material to cover. Uh, <clears throat> IEPs. Uh, the case from Albuquerque, that's the APS, Albuquerque Public Schools, that's a case involving uh, the, I, I just wanted to highlight this language that the court said that the school offered a cogent and responsive uh, explanation for why uh, they were going to drop the number of minutes of speech therapy. And that language comes from Andrew F. Andrew F. says, courts will defer to the professional expertise of schools, but only if you have a cogent and responsive explanation for what you're doing. 
So I really view Justice Roberts' decision in Andrew F. as a challenge to our professionalism. I think he's really saying, you know, we want to defer to the educational expertise of the educators, but we want to know that you're using your expertise properly and that when you make a decision that the parent disagreed with, you can offer a cogent and responsive explanation for it. Uh, the Pottsgrove case is a case where the kid had a, the court pointed out you have a goal with regard to toileting, you have no plan to achieve the goal. Simple lesson, and he quotes a football coach, wasn't Herm Edwards a football coach somewhere? Does that name sound familiar? Um, and he said, you, you, you know, you got to have a plan. Uh, okay, IEP meetings. Now, the standard for your IEP meetings, which you call the CCC, I got to get used to that. Most people call these IEP team meetings. In Texas, we call them ARDS, A-R-D. Uh, somebody said it's anguish, remorse, and denial. Uh, that's not really true. It's admission, review, and dismissal. But ARD is very handy. That way, when there's a really tough one, we know what it is. We've been at a hard ARD, all right? So we call them ARDS. You call them CCCs. I thought the CCC was one of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, <laughs> the Civilian Conservation Corps. You all remember that from history? So the standard is meaningful parent participation. So MSPs and LSPs, I already introduced you to that topic. And I would just encourage you to think about this. How do you prepare for an IEP meeting knowing that you're dealing with a very sophisticated parent? I'll bet you bring your A game. That's my experience. You bring your A game. We tend to rise to the level of expectation. And, and so when you know this is a parent who is going to hold us accountable, this is a parent who knows their stuff, they are articulate, they are assertive, appropriately assertive, we need to bring our A game to this meeting. And I'll bet you do. I'll bet that's how you prepare for that meeting. How do you prepare for the less sophisticated parent? You know, the interesting thing to me is that the litigation over meaningful parent participation is almost always for parents who are extensively involved in the process. These are the parents who have eight or ten meetings during the year. They bring their counsel with them. They have long meetings. They're very involved. And then they claim that they were denied meaningful parent participation. They usually lose that argument. But they're the ones who have the wherewithal and the lawyers to bring that kind of argument. I, I am, I, I'm convinced there's parents who are denied meaningful parent participation. But it's not your MSPs. It's your LSPs. How are we dealing with the parent who doesn't speak English? How are we dealing with the parent who didn't get out of the eighth grade? How are we dealing with the parent who is undocumented and not supposed to be in this country? You know, those kids are entitled by the U.S. Constitution to, a, to an appropriate... The Supreme Court's already decided that in a case from Texas a long time ago. They decided that the children of undocumented immigrants are entitled to the constitutional right to an education just like everybody else is. That parent's not going to be very vocal or assertive on behalf of their child, it's our job. It's our job to step into that. So when I talk about meaningful parent participation, uh, I get frustrated when I read some of the cases uh, because it's, all, it's almost all, and you can see in my materials, it's mostly about parents who are very, very involved. Least restrictive environment. This has been part of the law since 1975. And the Hamilton County case makes the point that you can be mainstreamed even though you're not going to achieve at grade level. And I, I don't think that's terribly new. I think this is a case where somebody said the wrong thing and that's why they ended up in court. Clear Creek, this is a case where the district's own documentation undercut its position. The school district was trying to move this student to a more restrictive environment and the parent didn't agree to it. So they end up in litigation over it. And the, uh, and the district's data was very detailed. It's very impressive. And the data showed that the student was on track to achieve the goals that had been established. Well, if he's on track to achieve the goals, why do you want to move him to a more restrictive? That, that's what he's doing in the less restrictive environment. Why do you want to move him? So they, they lost that case. Cecil County, this one I just asked, do you think we'll see more like this? You know, <clears throat> least restrictive environment has been in the law, I think, because back in the 60s and 70s, a facility that only served people with disabilities was usually not a high quality facility. I don't think I'm stereotyping too much. You hear the term warehouse a lot. And, and, uh, and, and one of the reasons we got this law is the law was designed to say, let's not do that. Let's, bring, let's serve these kids along with everybody else. Let's, let's bring them into the mainstream, et cetera. So that's been the goal. Now it's 2019 and what's happening 
is there are a lot of private schools that serve a niche population and they're really good schools and the parents want their kids there. That's what this case from Cecil County is all about. This is a school that only serves high achieving students with learning disabilities. So guess what? Everybody at that school has a disability. Well, as a lawyer, I can argue about that one real easy. Your Honor, every single child in that school has a disability. That is not the least restrictive environment. And I'm right. I think we're gonna, I think it may be, Congress may the next time they look at this, they may take a little different look at this. Because this is a high quality school, I feel sure. And a lot more parents, they want that. They want the school that only serves students with autism. They want the school that only serves students with dyslexia. They understand by LRE standards, that's highly restrictive, but that's what they want. So we may see more of that, we'll see. Ah, liability, oh, I love this case. I mean, I shouldn't, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer, but this, this little girl, I hope there was no long-term trauma. Where is this case? Uh, this little girl got uh, stuck on the bus in the morning and she was strapped in and she couldn't get out and the, and the bus driver didn't check the bus carefully. She's four years old, she fell asleep, she's left on the bus, the bus is parked in the dark bus barn and she's stuck there for 75 minutes. Now, now I know that's not good, but what, what I found hilarious is when the mother goes to talk to the superintendent's executive's assistant, and I can just hear this, I can hear this happening. Oh, well bless her heart, there she was. Well, you know, things like this happen four or five times a year around here, I can just hear it. <laughs> it's like, they do? They happen four or five times a year. The court said that's maybe deliberate indifference. So, you know, the lesson of this case is number one, don't say that. And number two, check the bus one more time. Check the bus one more time, pretty simple. Uh, so put that in the list of things not to say. Things like this happen four or five times a year. Uh, a lot of these cases are about physical injuries, some from alleged abuse. You know, I consider myself an advocate for public education and I believe very strongly in what you all are doing. Uh, you know, I, I never went to public school until I went to the University of Texas, uh, but I, I think it's, it's, the, it's the cradle of our civilization and our democracy, and it's so essential. So I, I, I applaud what you guys do day in and day out. And it hurts me to read cases where school people are accused not just of negligence or carelessness, but actual abuse of kids. This, unfortunately, happens. And it frequently, when it does happen, and when it ends up in court, it is frequently our most vulnerable children who are subject to this. Think about this. You, you started school, right? School started in Indiana? Let's just assume that somewhere in Hoosier land today, some fifth grade teacher in a regular classroom is going to do something colossally stupid. They're going to say something they shouldn't have said. They're going to do something they shouldn't have said. Uh, chances are you're going to hear about that pretty quickly. Am I right about that? That student is either going to, some 20 students in that classroom, somebody's going to report it to an administrator or somebody's going to report it to the parent and the parent is going to call you tomorrow. You're going to hear about it pretty quickly. What if that teacher, however, is dealing with nonverbal, low functioning students in your life skills unit. Abuse can occur there and it can go on and on and we don't know about it. I call some of these cases aid versus teacher because a lot of these cases begin when the teacher's aid speaks up. Uh, so I, I have a couple of uh, words of advice about this. Uh, number one, be careful who you hire to teach in that classroom. You know in Texas I tell people we ought to be as careful about hiring the life skills teacher as we are the head football coach. I would suggest the head basketball coach in Indiana. Let's be real careful about who we put in charge of that classroom. That's number one. Number two, uh, keep an eye on it. Now in Texas, we've got a state law now that requires video cameras in these classrooms upon parent request. That is expensive and I don't really think it's very effective. Uh, th what's effective is the somebody dropping by periodically uh, to just check up on things. I think it's important not just from a safety perspective, but also just to show interest in those children. You know, sometimes uh, we may tend to spend more attention on the kids that are achieving well academically. Uh, we, sh we should value these kids just as much, so keep an eye on that classroom. And third, cultivate a relationship with the teacher aides. Some of these cases come up when the teacher aide speaks up, but the teacher aide should have spoken up six months earlier and the teacher's aide didn't feel comfortable speaking up. So let's cultivate a relationship with our teacher aides, just make sure that this never happens, okay? 
Uh, all right, parent rights and responsibilities. This uh, Harris case, this is a case where uh, the student was 18 years old and the parent filed a due process hearing and the parents and the school said, I mean the, uh, yeah, the, the student said, I don't want any part of that and the court dismissed it. So it gives me the opportunity to let you know I've read The Prophet by Khalil Gibran and, uh, and he said, your children are not your children. They are arrows shot from your bow and once you shoot them, they're gone. So there you have it, especially when they're 18. There's a couple of cases in here where school districts have imposed communication protocols uh, on a parent. Now this is, this is a communication protocol on what I call that parent. And when I say that parent, somebody's face comes up in the radar screen of your mind, right? So this is the parent that consumes 80% of your time if you're the special education director. Uh, I think every one of these cases, the schools uh, prevail in the litigation, but here's what you need to be aware of. If you have a communication protocol because you feel that the parent has abused methods of communication, uh, you're probably going to be okay with that, but be prepared for an accusation of retaliation because that's what's going to happen. That parent may uh, go to their lawyer and say, well, I'm the only parent who has to jump through this particular hoop in order to communicate with people. And that's true. That's true. The school has imposed a communication protocol on this one parent. So you have to be prepared to explain why you felt that was necessary. Uh, and you'd be prepared for the fact that, that that may not be the end of it. The parent now is going to say, you're singling me out and you're retaliating against me. So be prepared for that. We have a lot of cases in, uh, about personnel in special ed, but only one in, in this last year that I brought up, and they're typically retaliation cases. And I'm going to use a baseball analogy here. Here's how a retaliation case works. If I allege that I've been subjected to adverse, I mean, I'm sorry, that I've engaged in protected activity, that gets me to first base. Like, I'm the one who disagreed at the CCC meeting. I'm the one who advocated for better services for our special ed kids. That gets me to first base. If I allege that something bad happened to me, like I got demoted, uh, my contract was not renewed, uh, my coaching duties and the stipend that go with it were taken away from me, that's an adverse action that gets me to second base. Cases, people always get to second base in retaliation cases. The hard part is getting around third base and scoring, and in order to do that, you have to prove that these two things are connected, that the reason that I got punished is because of my advocacy. So just be, this documentation comes into play here. Your personnel decision should be based on non-discriminatory, non-retaliatory, job-related behavior. And we want documentation to reflect that. Uh, let's see. Do you ever get prescriptions from doctors for special education services? Uh, this case from Williamson County and the related services section of my material is, is pretty typical. Uh, it, the court says special ed is not prescribed by a doctor. We welcome doctor's input. We welcome it. Thank you. But we're not Walmart. We don't fulfill prescriptions. That's not how it works. Uh, the Kane case is about, the letter to Kane is all about who's responsible when the student is missing related services sessions. We were supposed to provide speech therapy every week. We only provided it two-thirds of the weeks. Do we have to make them up? A lot of that depends on who was responsible. Did the student miss the speech therapy because we spent the speech therapy to the legal conference in Indianapolis? We probably need to make that one up. Did the student miss the therapy session because the parents were still on vacation? We don't have to make that one up. Um, now the Fairlawn case is kind of an interesting one. This is a case where the student needed a particular type of medication uh, and an aid on the school bus. And it was pretty serious because if the student had a seizure that lasted for more than a couple of minutes, there were severe health consequences. The school said, okay, we'll put it in the health plan. We'll put it in the health plan. And the parents sued over that and said, no, I want it in the IEP. And you might look at that and think, well, what difference does it make? The school's giving the parent the service they want and they wrote it into the health plan, what's the deal? And what the court said is, the health plan is not as good a protection for the parent as an IEP is. The health plan can be changed by the school, the IEP can be changed only by the CCC, and the parent is a part of that. So it's a good illustration of how the IEP is a superior document. By the way, an IEP is superior to a 504 plan. Well, same reason. Do you invite your parents to 504 meetings? I bet you do, but guess what? You don't have to. 
If you wanted to change a 504 plan and you didn't want to invite the parent to the meeting where you're going to do that, I wouldn't advise it. But if you did that, I could defend it because 504 does not require that the parent be at every single meeting. But it, IEP has to be. So a uh, lot of reasons why the IEP is the superior program. Oh, this is a wonderful case here. I just, I just came across this one, Wong versus Seattle. This is a fight between parents named Pontrelli versus Wong. I'm so disappointed that the other parents are not called white, because then we'd have white v. Wong. <laughs> I always look for humor. Uh, this is a case where the, the, parent, the other parent, the parents get a temporary restraining order to keep the Wong kid out of school. The Pontrellis said that Wong, the Wong kid, was, was bullying the Pontrelli kid. So, I'm, I, I'm sure they ask the school to help, but they also go to court and they get a restraining order to keep the Wong kid out. And then the Wongs sue the school. And so this is this classic illustration where you guys get, the school district gets caught in the middle of parents who are at war with each other. And the court ruled for the school. The, the, school, what, the school didn't ask for the temporary restraining order. In fact, they opposed it and tried to get it dismissed. And the court described the Pontrellis as shockingly insensitive, unfortunate, and misguided. I just wish they were named White, then we'd have classic value of Battle of White v. Wong. So, all right. Uh, I, when I have a group this large, I want to bring this up because I think it's important. I so much support what you all are doing. I so much support the goals behind IDEA. We, uh, <clears throat> I don't know that other countries do what we do. You know, our commitment to serve everybody is remarkable and to serve everybody with an appropriate education regardless of what that costs that is remarkable but I will tell you our system of legal disputes is broken and there's a lot of examples of this that I offer at the very end of my handout that I call our broken system uh, I would just suggest if we wanted to create a system that primarily benefited lawyers we could hardly have done a better job um, there, you read some of these cases where hearing officer decisions go on for 15, 18, 20 days, and then they end up in court and they lag on for years. You know, the idea was a parent can, ought to be able to have a complaint and get it resolved in 45 days. That's how it was supposed to work. We have mucked it up with so many laws, rules, regulations. It's very legalistic. It ought to be simple. Despite that, the goals are noble. The services you provide are important. And I don't know if you all know Molly Ivins, but she was a legendary journalist in Texas. And there is a new movie out about her. It's called Raise Hell, the story of Molly Ivins. And so uh, take a look at that. And she used to say, good on you. So I say, good on you. And thank you to the IEP Resource Center and Indiana State University in the state of Indiana. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. Let's take a break.